You know, when I look like a Muslim, you expect things from me, if you're a good Muslim, to be exactly as Islam has taught. The minute you see me, you expect a truthful person, a person who's of high standards, high morals, high values, a person who helps others, a person who's not judgmental of others. Are we really that way? It is supposed to be a part of the package. The minute you speak to someone, even if it's over the phone, and the name happens to be Muhammad. For example, a common name. The name happens to be Muhammad. Who are you? You're an ambassador, not just of Islam, but even your name is Muhammad, peace be upon him. Named after the Prophet, peace be upon him, right? Muhammad. Imagine if you were a person who did not work on your bad habits. If you harmed people, if you never helped others, if you never reached out to those who harmed you, then what was the point of giving yourself that name? Or why did your parents give you that name? Subhanallah. No wonder we call each other Mo and Mo because we're embarrassed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. When I speak of the package, you know, we speak, I, I've mentioned the word package four or five times. The reason is, we're supposed to be Muslim. The minute I'm a Muslim, you, know, you need to know what's inside. I give you one little example in the form of a light statement. So they say there was a teacher, English teacher. The English teacher is asking the students to make sentences with words. So the teacher says, make a sentence with sugar in it. So someone says, I had sugar in the morning. Another one says, you're as sweet as sugar. Someone else says something else. And one boy puts up his hand. He says, I drank tea in the morning. So the teacher says, where's the sugar? Do you know what he says? It's in the tea. <laughs> it's in the tea. That's a package. Subhanallah. I had my tea in the morning. Where's the sugar? The sugar is inside. Didn't you say, make a sentence with sugar in it? Well, the sugar was in it. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. The reason I say it's a package is because with us, you're a Muslim. Well, where's the sugar? It's supposed to be in you. The problem with us is, we're on artificial flavoring, mashallah. Sweetness. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us sweet. Wallahi, to be sweet is a good quality. To be sweet, especially to the right people. Here we are speaking about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His words, his actions are all there to prove his words. That's why he says the best from among you are those who are best to your family members and I am the best to mine. From among you, I'm the best. Subhanallah. Which means he lived up to what he said. Many of us preach one thing and we live another. And this is where we falter and this is where we actually go wrong. When you accuse someone of having an affair, Allahu Akbar, the anger and curse of Allah are upon you. To accuse a person of committing adultery is one of the biggest crimes you could ever engage in. It is one of the few crimes where Allah has mentioned both the anger and the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Especially to accuse a woman, but even if you were accusing a man. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our tongues. Nowadays, we take it very lightly. Oh, did you hear the latest? We'll phone people, we'll spend money to commit a sin. Phone someone, go and visit them. Hey, I brought you hot spicy news. What's the news? Hey, you know so and so? They're going out with so and so. You know they're having an affair. And you know what? This, and you know what? That. Allahu Akbar. The one who is uttering it has the curse and anger of Allah because of what they said. The one who heard it has also the curse and anger of Allah by association that is mentioned in the Quran. Why do you associate with those who have earned the anger of Allah? Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tatawallaw qawman ghadib Allahu alayhim O you who believe never ever befriend or don't even find yourselves in the company of those who have earned the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Stay far from them. So when you know someone is accusing others, they are also from amongst those who are earning the anger. If you are with them, if the rock has to drop from heaven, you'll also die with the same rock. Because you are sitting in their house. In fact, the rocks would fall from hell, not from heaven. Listen to what Allah says in Surah An-Nur. Oh, those who accuse believing females of the sin of adultery, Allah says for them is the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even on the day of Qiyamah, their hands and their feet and their body organs will bear witness against them. And Allah says, we have cursed them completely. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our mouths and our tongues. And may He make us from amongst those who can worry about ourselves. Nowadays, the beauty is, we tend to entertain stories regarding people we don't even know. 
And sometimes people want to feel important and they want to make minimum or they want to make fair seeming the sin that they are committing by saying, well, everyone's doing it today. You see, if they are committing adultery, they then think everyone else is committing adultery as well. So they look at the others and say, well, everyone's doing it. No, not everyone is doing it. Believe me, there are people who are pure, who are chaste, who are protecting themselves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have made yourself cheap, may Allah protect us all. May He grant us all protection, inshallah, and may He forgive us. And at the same time, may He purify us in every single way. So, a person who has a guilty conscience likes to accuse others and wants to make things cheap so that they can seem to be part and parcel of the rest of the ummah. Yet, they are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May we never ever do that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about someone who accuses his own wife. Allahu Akbar. A person who accuses his own wife, if he has seen with his own eyes but has no more witnesses, then they engage in something known as li'an. And li'an is a specific type of res resolving this particular crisis, where the two will be separated on condition, that they bear witness four times that they were speaking the truth, or that the man was speaking the truth, and the female must say, no, he is lying, four times. The fifth time, the man must say, may the curse of Allah be upon me if I am lying. And the first time the female must say, May the anger of Allah be upon me if, I, if he is telling the truth. Allahu Akbar. And if that's the case, the two are separated and one wonders how wise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he has actually granted us the resolution of this problem in the dunya in this way. If that happens, if this li'an happens, both parties will be considered innocent and truthful. And we will close the chapter there and then. The female will then be considered truthful because it may have been a misunderstanding, it may have been something, whatever it was. But imagine, we are not allowed to mess our tongues with that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about al-mubahala, where when there is a lie that is being promoted, and that lie is very serious, then, فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ Allah told Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell the Christians to come, Bring all your family, come and stand on that side. We bring our families, our children, and we stand on this side here. And we invoke the curse upon the liar. So we say, oh Allah, curse us, completely destroy us if we are lying. And you must say the same. <laughs> Believe me, they did not come to that. They did not want to even entertain that. Because everybody knows that that is very serious. But that is a way of resolving the huge disputes. If the Christians had come to us with that, Believe me, today the problem would have been solved. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Not only those people of the book, but these problems are within the Muslim ummah, where people are accusing others. People are destroying communities by spreading rumor, by spreading disaster. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really grant us all forgiveness. It, it needs to be an environment of love. When people come to the masjid, there was a time when I was young, I used to look at some people who were a little bit older. Nowadays, maybe inshallah, I hope it's not there. So we used to look at some of them, they used to give us dirty looks at times just because of, you know, perhaps we might not have been dressed how they wanted us to be dressed. Brother, I've come to the masjid, come on man, you need to smile at me, make me feel at home. Tomorrow I'll come inshallah in a better position, in a better way. But if you chased me away, for, hey, what are you doing here? You're lost here today. Where do you want to go? The pub is that side brother. Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive us. These are the type of words that chase people away from goodness. This is the house of Allah. Anyone who makes others comfortable here and creates space for them is actually from among the best of people. Do you know there is a narration I came across today when I was actually going through the ahadith for this topic that the Prophet ﷺ says, the best from among you in salah is the one who has the softest shoulders. And do you know what that means? What's a soft shoulder? You know when I'm standing comfortable in Ramadan, and then you have the guy who wants to cross the red traffic light, he budges in. And what happens? What do we do? By default, we just push him, push him further, push him further, right? That's what a lot of people do. And they, and they, they make sure they make his life a misery. When he goes to sujood, they're there before him and there's no space for him to go in. Subhanallah. The reason why you're laughing is because you know what I'm talking about. Yes. So you want to be the best of people. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, speaks about the same thing in the hadith. He says, the best of you are those whose shoulders are soft in salah, in the saf. What that means, someone comes, you create space for them. So what? Make space for someone. Perhaps Allah will make space for you in Jannah. Amin, amin, amin. 
The next time someone barges in, make space for them. Subhanallah. Like I say, and say to yourself and say to Allah that, Oh Allah, you know, I might just have been disturbed a little bit, but you make space for me in paradise. Amen. Problems happening especially in this country is the act of labeling someone uh, as Wahhabi and the other parties reclaiming themselves as uh, Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So this is the situation is uh, I used to follow one of the uh, well-known ustaz in this country and always quoted his words. But I encountered some Facebook pages uh, attacking him being one of the Wahhabi and proved with some screenshots of his wordings. But both parties are holding Islam as their religion. So what happened is, it creates doubt in my mind towards the Ustaz. So uh, can I seek explanation for this issue thing? I didn't want the sketch question, but anyway, it's the last one. So let's go for it. Uh, as much as I wouldn't like to address the matter, I have to. Okay? Let me explain something. It's not an issue of Wahhabi, non-Wahhabi, what, what. People have been here for years on end. It's an issue of intolerance. It's an issue of extremism on all parties. I believe every Ustaz makes mistakes, without exception. Take the good from all of them and leave the bad. When someone preaches hatred against another, discount it, and if you have the opportunity, go to them and tell them, please, don't talk about other people. I want to ask you a question and I'm going to stand for this. You know who I am, right? I'm a brother of yours in faith. Have you ever heard me talk bad about another person? No. Mashallah. <laughs> Mashallah. The innocent have borne witness. Do you agree? <laughs> Why? I have so much of goodness to share with the world that I don't have time to worry about others. Come on, come on. Those who talk about others don't have something to present themselves. I'm busy doing my work. So many people send me messages, oh, someone called you a Wahhabi, someone called you a Sufi, someone said you're a Salafi, someone said you're a Deobandi, someone said you're a Baralvi. Some of these names, I don't even know what they mean, to be honest with you. I was waiting for the day they said someone called you a chocolate man, because that's, more, that's true, you know. But all these names, for me, I say, hey, look, I know what I am, I'm a Muslim, and I'm trying to spread a good message amongst all groups. Let me carry on doing my work. The minute I turn to fight them, I become a fighter, I cause a bigger problem, and now who's going to do this good work? Because my energy, like I said earlier, all the energies are now being utilized, waste of resources, to do something where it's going to be less beneficial, in fact, destructive. So please do yourself a favor. When you hear labeling, you need to be more intelligent than the label. You need to rise above it and tell yourself, whatever good is coming from this person, I will take it. Whatever bad is coming, I will discount it. The reason is, even if you belong to one group, it does not mean the ustazas of your group, everything they say is right. They will also say wrong things. You will have to pick it up. And it doesn't mean that there is a Christian across the road so they cannot teach you something good. I have had people who taught me mathematics and geography and biology and sociology and English language who were Jews and Christians and Hindus and people who belong to other faiths. I took from them whatever I had to and I left whatever I didn't. You follow what I'm saying? So when you go to the university, you will have a lecturer who might be gay, for example, you know, I'm not talking about this nation in particular, but maybe in Europe, okay? You take from them whatever you feel you need to take from them and leave the rest. I'm there to study petroleum engineering, for example, or whatever else. I took whatever I had to and that's it. And I respect them for having given me what they did. That's humanity. The problem with us is, the problem is all over. We all are guilty of labeling others. This one is this. Let's, let's understand. It's qualities that make us or break us. You have a bad quality. Look, I'm sitting with people. I don't need to know what inclination he is or I am. I know I get along on common factors that are 9,999 compared to the one item that I might, I might find that I'm different with him in. Do you know? So this is why I say, let's not allow our nation to crumble based on this labeling that's going on take the good from everyone and leave that which is not good no matter where it's from may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness may allah bless your nation may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you strength and growth and may whatever issues you may be having be resolved in the best possible way that results in the true growth of your beautiful nation
every one of us undertakes to improve himself or herself in so many ways. Let's not think while I'm speaking today that, yes, I know someone like this. Yes, I know a person who perhaps might benefit from this. When we ourselves have our own weaknesses, Tuba liman shagalahu aibuhu an nas. You know, give good news of perhaps a place in paradise to the one whose own weaknesses keep him or her occupied from engaging or entertaining or looking into the weaknesses of others in a negative way. If you have seen the weaknesses of another, perhaps you would like to be positive about it. Try and help them. Try and say something to them that might encourage them to quit their bad ways and habits. Not forgetting that every one of us, myself included, we have ways and habits that need correction, rectification, improvement, perhaps even eradication. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Accepting correction is also of improving yourself and community at large. Many people think, I know, in my field I'm so and so, and I know what I've achieved. Who is he to tell me? Subhanallah. The minute we think that, we've already dropped. We've dropped society, community, because we all need correction. So much so, that when the Imam in Salah, in prayer, is reciting and he makes a mistake, it is the right of everyone who knows the blunder to actually correct that Imam because it's the word of Allah. Don't make a mistake in those words. And a good person, a good Imam, a good person in the front would actually consider it an honor to be corrected by someone, no matter who it is. He could be young and old, tall and short. He could have yelled it and screamed it from the corner or wherever else. So what? It was a correction. It was needed. Everyone will correct you, but in a different way. Perhaps some might correct you in a way you may not like it. I would like to think if I were to correct someone, I choose the best possible way so that they don't feel bad. But sometimes, even if you've chosen the best way, they will still feel bad. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So my duty is to be the best when I correct. And my duty again is when I'm corrected, don't feel bad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. The same applies to a man who has a business. So you open up a supermarket in the corner there. And what happens? That one starts progressing. And you are having great success in your business. So next thing, there's another corner there. You open another branch. It works. When that one works, you open a third one. Then you start thinking of crossing to another city. Then you start thinking of another country. And if you are sharp enough, you can have something across the globe. Why? Because one worked. The other one worked. And I want to see this whole thing working forever. And I want to progress. But how much money are you going to use in your life? Not even one-tenth of what's going to come out of those shops. Do you agree? Not even one-tenth. A man, for example, earned one billion dollars in his life. What did he spend? A few million, maybe. That's also if he was generous. Some people, the more they have, the stingier they become. One brother told me, I've got a shop in town. You know, when the poor people come, they never ask for a discount. But when a rich man comes, he says, hey, what's your last price? But brother, take a look at that vehicle out there, man. And the other man who came on public transport told me, how much does this cost? He took the money out and carried on. It's the rich sometimes who want more and more discount. Why is it? I don't know. I'm not a rich man, alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant barakah to all those who have wealth. Wallahi, it's not a bad thing, but it's just a bigger test. And sometimes fewer people pass the test. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the passing of our tests. So as we would like another branch and make a lot of money, we are only going to spend a fraction. When it comes to knowledge, with time, we will be spending maximum. And if we don't, we are losing. And why I raise this is because one of the points to be mentioned is that we need to gauge our progress. And we will be able to understand how much progress we've made by looking into how well we've implemented what we've learned and how we have benefited others from the knowledge we have achieved. How did you benefit? Don't think, no, I'm just a small toy, you know. I can't give. No. I have seen beggars take out money from their pockets giving other beggars money. And that's when a tear rolled down my cheek. Today when I give, one dollar, two dollars to a beggar on the street. I don't know if you have beggars here, but I think every country more or less should be. Uh, you might say, no, they're from outside. But wherever they're from, it's okay. <laughs> it's an opportunity to give wealth. So you see a wealthy man giving five dollars. And then you see that man giving one dollar. 
Who has given more? Who has given more? Wallahi, percentage-wise, the one from five who gave one has given out 20%. And the one from five million who's given out five has given out naught point naught 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 naught. I don't even know where the one fits in. Percent. So who gave more? That's why I say, you have lots of knowledge, you have a bigger responsibility. Lots of knowledge, you have to share more. You have a bigger responsibility. Percentage-wise, what you are giving is very small. But Alhamdulillah, Allah doesn't look at it that way. For as long as you've tried and you've given it maximum, Alhamdulillah. But if you have less knowledge, remember, don't think for a moment, I cannot give. Look at that beggar whom I told you moments ago about. He had little bit. He shared it with someone. What about us? We have a little bit of knowledge. Share it with your family. The Prophet says, These people who work for you, these people who serve you, they are your brothers. Pause for a moment. If Allah wanted it, it could have been the other way around. Today someone is serving you at home. Today someone is helping you or they are under your employment. Remember, if Allah wanted, it could have been the other way around. And if He wants, it can be the other way around very quickly, very soon. And if Allah wants, it can be the other way around with your children and their children. We have seen it happening where a man who was employed by another man, while the first man's children later on went to seek job at the second man's children. It has happened. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, understand this. And this is why the hadith says, these are your brothers. They are your brothers in humanity at least. Because we know that brotherhood is on different levels. You are a brother in blood. You are a brother higher than Allah wa ta'ala says, Under you are a brother in humanity who also has rights to be fulfilled for those who share humanity with you in order that the earth is not downgraded into a chaotic playing field. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. So the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these are your brothers. Allah has placed them temporarily under your guardianship or your authority. That's what it is. So whomsoever has his or her brother under his or her authority, he should feed him with food that he eats himself. What this means is you don't just throw leftovers and say, okay, these are workers, just throw the leftovers at them. No, we have a bad habit sometimes. We will cook the food, beautiful food, the cook the food, the cook that's not allowed to eat from it. How is that? That is not allowed in Islam. Share with them a little piece. Subhanallah. They will cook it even better because they know I'm going to eat this. Subhanallah. So if you want your cook, subhanallah, to become a big chef, all you need to do is say, don't worry, we're all going to eat the food. See the importance they give that food. Subhanallah. That is Islam. Feed them with the same food that you eat. That's what, subhanallah, to be, let's be honest. A lot of us are guilty. A lot of us are guilty of giving leftovers that we ourselves would not eat to those who work for overs that we it's wrong to give leftovers that are worth eating to say look we're not going to eat this if you would like it you may take it but to throw remains that you've eaten half of that you would but to throw else gave you a half of that are worth it to them just because they are in need they are desperate they are working perhaps that are worth is definitely not the quality of a muslim you have in you a portion of the remnants of the period of ignorance that's what it is. You have in you a Many of us forget this. We think, okay, when we talk about kindness, it means money. So I took out 20 pounds and I put it in the box. I was kind. That's not the definition of kindness. That's a charity. Yes, if you did it with the correct intention, alhamdulillah. But kindness extends way beyond that, my brothers and sisters. And charity begins at home. And this is why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa extends it further when he says the best from amongst you he uses the same wording and he uses a different category of people so he says khayrukum khayrukum li ahlihi the best from amongst you which means the best of people are those who are best to their family members you know the term ahl it starts off with a spouse and everyone else in the family now one might say, well, there's a contradiction here. In one narration, he says the best from among you are those who benefit the others the most. And another, he says the best from among you are those who are best to their family members. No contradiction. Your family members are people. 
they are the closest people to you. You are going to benefit them to start with and then everybody else. What's the point of me benefiting the rest of the world but when I come home, we have this cat and mouse relationship with our own children as you knock the door or as they hear you open the door or as they hear your car just come into the drive if you have a drive or on the road and everyone is helter skelter hidden and gone. Subhanallah. Why? Because dad is in. That's okay, but nowadays, because mom is in. Woo! Subhanallah, may Allah forgive us. I hope that's not the case. But you know, there's equality in the sense that nowadays we've got to speak about both. Subhanallah. May Allah help us all, mothers or fathers, no matter who. But may Allah make us from among those who can be kind to those we live with, who can start the trend of being good to our family members. Wallahi, if you want to be the best of people, it has to start at home. And the same applies to the spouse. You know you love them, but you need to say it again and again. Like we got to the food moments ago, and you need to say this food is, mashallah, it's really, really great. Even if the salt is a little bit more. Because sometimes, as I was saying, she spends so much time bringing it in front of us, and we are worried about how it's smelling, number one. And number two is we say, as we taste it, the salt is too much, no? <laughs> salt is too much, no? What are you talking about? She just looks at you and her face flops. I've been at it for three hours here, four hours. I've been busy with this for so many months. And what is she going to say? Next time I'll try a bit better, a bit harder. That's if she's a good woman. If not, she'll say, never going to cook this again. <laughs> typical. Never gonna, it's typical. Never going to cook this again. And if you have someone who's very witty, the next time there's salt to be put in, I'll call you to put it. So we need to praise the cooking of our wives. We need to praise their, 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 their dress code, especially, for example, I can let you know something that has worked for some people. Where you find some women, you know, they don't like to dress appropriately. So the husband sometimes wants to tell them something. There are two, three ways of doing it. You can either say, this is very bad. I don't want you to wear this. And you know, you might have a response. But if you want a response from the heart, what you do is, you tell them, the other dress looked much better than this. You see, so you are praising one thing and that praise is not there when the other thing is there. So you have told them in a way that this is what I really love. And go beyond the limits in praise. That's your wife. Don't worry. You can say whatever you want to. Mashallah. In terms of goodness. Like the food. You, when you eat, even if it is a little bit this way, that way, just praise it. Mashallah. See what it is. Praise the effort at least. Mashallah. You know. Let me tell you what has happened once. The Imam in the masjid said, you need to praise the cooking of your wife, just like I said now. So the man went home and he had this meal and he was looking at it and looking at his wife and smiling and all happy, mashallah, and excited and everything. And when he finished, he says, oh, it was awesome. And the wife says, what? I've been cooking for you for 21 years. You never said that. Today when the food came from the neighbor. You want to say it was awesome. <laughs> so he says, oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know. <laughs> Wherever you have faltered and whenever you have faltered, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. Seek the forgiveness of Allah. For this reason, there are different seasons and different days of the week. Not every day of the week is the same in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, every moment is a moment of tawbah and seeking forgiveness indeed. But there is a moment in the darkest hours of the night that is far more blessed than any other moment where we should not wait in order for that moment to arrive to seek the forgiveness of Allah when we have faulted, but rather we should repeat the repentance and the seeking of forgiveness at that time. Repetition, say it again. If I commit a sin now, I must repent now. I must not wait for the time of tahajjud, the last hours of the night, just before Salatul Fajr, to say, I will wait until that time because it is a blessed time and then I will seek forgiveness. I might die before that moment. My brothers, my sisters, don't wait for a season or a moment in order to seek forgiveness. Those seasons and moments are there in order for you to repeat and reiterate the fact that you have sought the forgiveness of Allah. And in the same way, 
that we will not wait for the time of tahajjud to come before we seek forgiveness. We will not wait for a Friday to come before we become obedient to Allah. Ask yourselves, my brothers, my sisters, how serious do we consider the issue of salah? How seriously do we take the issue of our dress code? Do we really think that we are going to be okay without tasting the negative effects of disobedience somewhere down the line when we have turned far away from Allah and become Muslimin who are only interested in the deen when there is a season. We become genuine when Ramadan comes in. The sins being committed are generally stopped. May Allah grant us an understanding. Yes, it is a good sign that we respect the month of Ramadan because indeed it is sacred. But it does not mean that success is for those who obey Allah only in the season or in the month of Ramadan or on a Friday and they forget Allah thereafter. Hey, tomorrow's the holiday. You can practice. You can start, inshallah. Take your kids out, inshallah. Go somewhere. Spend the time with them, the day. Go picnicking. Dad, for once, inshallah, cook. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So you spend time with them, you've taken them, they've come out with you, they've seen you, you've played with them, you rode a boat with them, you went out to the sling with them. What's it called? Subhanallah, reverse bungee. Oh, have you heard that? It's here, they were showing me. They were trying to talk me into going there. <laughs> Trust me. I told them, no, that's child's play, child's play. We do skydiving, mashallah. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. This is clean fun. People wonder, why on earth did you go skydiving? Well, I'm talking about it today. And that's what I'm telling you. That you know, the alternatives for our children, what are they? It may not be something as uh, difficult as a skydive, but it will be something that will keep them occupied. They have something to talk about, you know, really. Because it's better than a nightclub and it's better than so many other things that they want to do that that sometimes their friends pressurize them into doing. When you go to school on a Monday morning, the children go to school and what do they hear? Oh, I watched that movie. Did you see? Now they're 51 shades of gray. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> May Allah forgive us. They added one more shade. <laughs> Guess what that shade is? The last shade of gray is called black. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It darkens you, darkens your heart completely. Chases away the noor chases away everything. So if you're not going to... In fact, when they hear these things, they start thinking, what's this all about? When they come home, you know nothing about it because you're living in the 60s, dad. That's what it is. You need to be alert. You need to know what's going on. You need to know it and you need to be able to talk about it. And you need to be able to tell your child, listen, you know what? That's not what we're supposed to be doing. Because... And then you start rattling out the reasons, proper reasons. And they hear how people went to the nightclub and they enjoyed themselves with drugs and alcohol. And the children hear about it. And when they hear about it, what do they think? You know, after some time, some of the children might be trapped by shaitan because of peer pressure. And you need to know peer pressure is a reality. It can make a child suicidal. Do you know that? Some have already committed suicide because of peer pressure. And so we need to be alert. It's the love we're talking about. That love should make you cons be concerned enough to be able to take your child and to go on an outing, have fun. Climb the mountains, go mountain climbing, mashallah. Go biking, ride to Johor, mashallah. It's around the corner, I believe. <laughs> Please, my brothers and sisters, I'm not supposed to be begging you. I'm not supposed to be pleading with you. But I am telling you that for the sake of Allah, I'm pleading with you. To say, read the word of Allah before you leave your house every day. Even if it means reading one line. One line. Just one line. We have not asked for much. All we are doing is developing a link with Allah. A lot of us have no link with Allah. Some of us don't even read Jumu'ah. Some of us, we only on the day of Eid, the only thing we know is to say, Islamat, 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 Hari Raya and whatever else it is. Subhanallah. That's the only connection between us and Islam. Sometimes, 
But every day when you develop a link with Allah, let me tell you what will happen. Allah knows that this is my worshiper. He or she started her day with me. I will be with them for the rest of the day. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Now, even if you have a massive car crash through the day and you happen to die, guess where you're going to go? Your day started with Allah. You said Astaghfirullah. You exited the house. Tawakkaltu ala Allah. And after, after that, you passed away. People will also remember you that this person read the Quran before they left. They will be inspired by your deed and you will get a full reward for them following your example. Wow. Where did you go? You went to Jannah. Whereas before we leave, we are fighting. As we leave the home, we are swearing. As we go out, we are engaging in adulterous connections with you know, the opposite sex that are unacceptable and so on. And as we go, we want to go into the nightclubs or perhaps gambling. But the point that's being raised is lead by example. Leave your home in the morning after having read a verse or two of the Quran in your living area, in your dining room or in your lounge, a place where your children can see you, not privately in your bedroom where they don't know what went on. Let your children see you. It's not showing off. It is teaching them to, to, to live by example. We're living in a time where there's an industry that makes fun of everything. And their purpose is to actually decrease our sensitivity to the subject. They want to make us less and less sensitive to the, the honor we're supposed to show to the Messenger So eventually it's not a big deal. You guys know what's happening in Hollywood. There, were, there was Noah, a movie about Nuh then recently a movie about Musa and this is just them testing the waters. You understand what I'm saying to you? They're just testing the waters. And these movies are horrible. I don't, if you've seen it, make a step up, boycott these films, do not watch these films. We should have nothing to do with these films. You shouldn't even learn them to know what the kuffar are saying. There's no point in you learning what the kuffar are saying. They have nothing good to say. Don't worry about it. And as a matter of fact, their account, the Hollywood version, is a, a, a deviation from the biblical version, which is twisted already. <laughs> the Bible's version is bad enough. And then they add their own chaat masala on top, and then they make these movies. And you know, movies can have a very lasting effect on people. When you watch an image one time in your head, then you know, those of you who saw Prince of Egypt, when you think of Musa alayhi the picture comes in your head, that's messed up. That's not supposed to be there. So don't, don't watch this stuff. And if a new controversy comes out about some cartoon or something else, don't go look at it. Don't go look at it. Then you, if you go look at it, you're part of the problem. No, 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 I was just looking at it to see what they do. So I could say Astaghfirullah. No, you are part of the hit count. They're counting how many hits that video got, or how many clicks this image got. And you are now counted among them. You made it popular. You know when a video becomes popular, when a, vil a video has a million hits, then the next person clicks it because it has a million hits. When it has 10 million hits, you look at it, hey, it's got 10 million hits, it must be good. Must be something. If you are part of that hit count, then you are partly responsible for making it popular. We have to ignore this nonsense altogether. A dog barking cannot harm the sun. It's too high up. Let these people spit whatever they want. That cannot take anything away from the nobility of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says, رَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We raised your mention. When Allah raises something, no creation can bring it down, people. No creation can bring it down. They can say whatever they want. Whatever they want. It will change nothing. It will change nothing. It will take nothing away from the nobility of our Messenger ﷺ. And we have to adopt the prophetic model in responding to these insults. When the Messenger would be you know, insulted, and a poet would come in, instead of calling him Muhammad, call him Mudhammam. He would say, he's not talking about me, it's someone else. It's someone else. This, this is not our messenger, this is some twisted version of whatever they have in their head. You know, We cannot get so reactionary. Muslims have to show a higher level, a more sophisticated level of response to these people, to this craziness. And by the way, when we act crazy, then they turn around and say, see, we told you these people are crazy. Proved it. See? This religion, the religion of sophistication, the religion of sabr, the religion of thought, the religion that keeps asking people, Afala ta'akilun, why don't you use your minds? Think, think, think. 
Now it's associated with the most thoughtless people. We're supposed to be a model for humanity. Let's rise to that occasion. Our Messenger والسلام, deserves it. We have to show that loyalty to him والسلام. I heard the story of a unique young man recently who used to go and he used to go and uh, uh, work out at a gym. And you know in gym all kinds of men and women are there. Muslim guy used to go there and he used to keep his eyes low, low every time. Every time. And this girl at the reception, you know, and they're not dressed appropriately either. At the reception, she used to come check his card or whatever. Never looked up, constantly looked down. And he came every day, same way, never looked at her. And she knows, she works at the reception. She knows what men do when they walk in. She knows how they look at her. She knows. And she knows he doesn't look at her. So after like four months, she said, why don't you look at me? And he said, I can't. I, you know, I, I have to either I follow my temptations or follow Allah, that's it. You know, I, I just have to believe in, I believe in God, I, I, I can't. And he stopped coming after that because she talked to him and he thought this might turn into a fitna, he stopped coming. And she, the, the girl tells the story because she became a Muslim. She started looking up Islam after that because of the character of this young man, subhanAllah. So the, the young people, you guys, the, the, the young people here, by the way, you are more in touch with society than the elders here. The elders have a certain circle and they stay in that circle. You guys go to the mall, you go to campus, you go like hang out in different places, you meet America. <laughs> and through you, Islam will be exposed to America. But if you don't show Islam, if your character doesn't shine, then Islam will, America will never know what Islam is. Because the, the, our neighbors are not going to come into the masjid to learn what Islam is. They're not. The only time they will see Islam is through you, especially the young people here. Especially those in some places who play golf. I recall very clearly when I was a little bit younger, I entered one man's, you know, the loo in one man's home, and on the top, you know, the shanks, at the top, he had the rules of golf. And wallahi, you won't believe what I'm telling you, but some of you might have seen it because now they sell it on an international scale. They have a small golf green in the toilet, meaning a small little makeshift thing with a mini putter and a golf ball. And whilst you're sitting, you're busy putting. <laughs> Whilst you're sitting, you're busy putting. I'm not joking. I'm honest with you. You can Google it and check it, but please don't buy it. <laughs> so they're putting. Why? Because they're wasting their time. We are taught as Muslims, you go to the loo, it is known as liqaba il haja In order to finish your business. You go in there, you relieve yourself and you come out. There is a dua to read before you enter and as you exit. To ask Allah protection from the devil because we are taught that sometimes shaitan infests those areas. So you go in and you come out. Please don't play golf in the loo and stop reading magazines and all that in the toilet. I know so much so that last week someone sent me an image on WhatsApp. And I must share this with you because I just remembered it now. And it showed a man sitting on a pan and he, he said, oh no, I forgot my phone. Do you know what that means? That means people have made it their business that before you go to the loo, look for your phone. So that you can spend time now, you're sitting on WhatsApp, messaging people and so on. You know what happened to me a few weeks ago, I can't remember which airport it was, but there was a man speaking inside the toilet. I was waiting to come out and he's busy having a long conversation. And I, I, I wanted to tell him that, hey, finish up your business and get out. There's a queue here, man. And he was like, if you offered him coffee, he probably would have said, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> this is dangerous. I am the reason why I'm making mention of it. This is what is overtaking the globe at the moment. People are not understanding what their preferences are. And we were talking about developing a link with Allah. You need to get into the loo and come out of the loo. But remember something, in the same way we get so excited when we have Skype, when we have WhatsApp, when we have so many other types of or other formats. In Far East Asia, they have WeChat and they have Line and so on. All these different, you know, Tango and Viber and you name it, it's there. That is good. And mashallah, you, let's hope we are using it for something beneficial and good. But ask yourself, have I developed a small relation at least with the one who made me? When I go back to him, everything else will remain behind. Everything else will remain behind. The Prophet ﷺ says, the best companions in the eyes of Allah are those who are best to their own companions. That wording is superb, superb. خَيْرُ الْأَصْحَابِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرُهُمْ لِصَاحِبِهِ How amazing is that wording? Those of you who know the Arabic language, the best of companions 
in the eyes of Allah, is he who is best to his own companions. Your buddies, your friends, your circle, your companions, if you are the best to them, in the eyes of Allah, you are the best companion. And the hadith continues to say, وَخَيْرُ الْجِيرَانِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرُهُمْ لِجَارِهِ The best neighbor in the eyes of Allah is the one who is best to his neighbors. This hadith goes to show that Islam doesn't teach you to look at others and worry about how good they are. But Islam says, your value is based on how good you are, not how bad they are. Did you get that? Your value is determined by how good you are. Even in the face of harshness, in the face of bad, in the face of evil, someone swore you. Don't swear them back. Because that was not you. They showed their true colors. It's your opportunity to show yours. You don't stand for those values. You don't believe in that derogatory way of life. You believe in something much loftier. So if they were to swear you, if they were to laugh at you, if they were to mock at you, if they were to try and abuse you verbally, etc. You don't have to be the gangster type of person to say, What did you just say here? You know? I've avoided the salt and pepper in the statement, but you know what it is, right? But that's what they do. Hey, bro, what did you say? Say it again? No. You heard it, you did. You just got to look at them and laugh. <laughs> Especially if you're a big guy, big guy. And they look at you, they're probably... Mm. You know, when you turn around to look at them, they'll turn around to look at the air behind them. Subhanallah. Because they know, if this guy just blows, I'll be gone, man. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. But this is what it is. Learn to calm down. Learn to calm down. Look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Look at what he did. Here's the Prophet ﷺ telling us that in the eyes of Allah, the best neighbor is he who is personally best to his own neighbors. Forget about what they're doing. Are you good to them? If you're good to them, you're the best of the lot. To get a little bit of wealth through the wrong way is not difficult. But what is poisonous is the result of that. Because when we put that into our mouths, as Muslims we are taught that it contaminates the whole system. Say for example, I've had a meal. That meal was from money that I had extorted from someone or robbed or cheated them in one way or deceived them, even if they gave it willingly, but for as long as they were deceived. That money is dirty. When I purchased a meal for my family with dirty money, what we are taught is they will eat it. When they eat it, it has a negative effect on the esophagus, you know, the stomach and the intestines, the entire digestive system, the enzymes, everything is cursing this human being. And on top of that, the energy derived, you know, the energy that is derived, the, the flesh that is grown through that which we ate, which was earned in clandestine means, will not be used in something spiritual or good. So we have energy with our hands. We are not happy when we touch that which is permissible. We will only be quenched when we touch that which is not allowed. We are not happy when we look at what is allowed for us. We will only be quenched when we look at that which is prohibited. Why? Because we've eaten that which is what we call haram, that which is prohibited, dirty, filthy. So our eyes cannot be satisfied except through a filthy way. Our brains are contaminated that we can't think straight. This is why the Quran says, الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الرِّبَا لَا يَقُومُونَ إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسِ A person who consumes usury and interest, and you know as Muslims, we firmly believe that that is haram, it's prohibited, because interest makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. You've got money, you can lend it out, people who are poor will work for you forever and ever to give you more and more, and they have less and less. In a nutshell, when a person eats dirty wealth, they get up or they can only stand in a condition of the one who is possessed by the devil. Which means they are not happy when they look at their own wives, but when they see other women, they are excited and happy. It quenches their eyes. They cannot be happy when they touch something which is legitimate, but when they touch that which is prohibited, they are happy. They are excited. When they think, they can only think awkward. They were only happy with dirty thoughts, but the clean thoughts do not come into their minds. Similarly, when they have to judge between people, their minds are sometimes blown apart. They don't know how to think. They cannot see simple mathematics. One plus one to them is not two. Why? Because they don't have the brain. To them, they cannot see that this person is right and this is wrong because they have nourished that brain with that which is prohibited. 
The reason why we believe this is in order for us to realize the importance of clinging very solidly to that which is permissible and full of blessings. And this is why we say there is a lot to be learned when it comes to business ethics. We are supposed to be the most upright, very clear. Imagine when we are selling a motor vehicle, a true believer would be saying, you know what, I've made an accident, it was damaged here, the car looks brand new, it is a beautiful vehicle, but I need to tell you the three defects it has. Here you are, if you want it, take it, if you don't want it, leave it. That's a true believer. Whereas you have a person who might claim to believe, saying, no, nothing wrong, no accident, no nothing, beautiful car. It was better for that person to say, here's the vehicle, look at it nicely, if you like it, take it, if you don't leave it, that's even a better statement than that. So we need to choose. And the result of it will be either we are blessed or we lose blessings. The choice is yours. It's important to say the dua or the supplication that is in our mind or on our tongues as soon as we have the opportunity to say it. Once it comes to your mind, just utter it, say it. You know, Let the supplication come out, release it. Because you don't know when is the time for acceptance. You know dua, when we call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all have needs. One wonders sometimes whether it will be given to us exactly as we are asking for it because the Almighty has heard it without a doubt. He knows and at the same time He responds. But whether or not He gives it to us exactly as we want, only He knows. So it's important for us to choose moments that are more blessed. And sometimes the minute you think of something, if you say it, it is something that would be uh, giving preference to the Almighty over everything else. So if you notice when I speak, a lot of the times I'm in the middle of a lecture and what I would do is I would say, May Allah grant us goodness. May Allah bless us. May Allah cure those who are sick. May Allah have mercy on those who have passed away. May He grant us a deep understanding. May He grant us so much so that people actually call me deep understanding because I'm a person who always says, May He grant us a deep understanding. Sometimes the understanding is very shallow. And sometimes, you know, uh, people think that, oh, we're very knowledgeable. But the truth is, we're not. We're not. We have a little bit of knowledge. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is the owner of all knowledge. And our little knowledge compared to what even the other true scholars of deen have is absolutely no. So we need to know, let's swim in the ocean of knowledge and let's continue learning, continue correcting ourselves and at the same time call out to the Almighty, ask Him, tell Him. Uh, at any given time when you are walking, when you are driving, when you are at home, when you are in the kitchen, perhaps cooking, perhaps helping, just say, Ya Allah bless my child, Ya Allah bless me, Ya Allah protect me from evil. Think of these things and the minute you think of it, make a dua, say it out, Could talk to your maker. It develops a beautiful link between you and Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is what we want. This is the sweetness. You know people feel scared but they forget to say oh Allah protect me from fear. People feel so much and they forget to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala things. People are worried about poverty and they don't say ya Allah protect us from poverty. People look at some others who perhaps are maimed or who do not have organs or who are sick and ill and they forget to say or they don't bother to say oh Allah at that split moment oh Allah grant me cure from sickness oh Allah I thank you for what you've given me. Really these are some of the words that need Need to be on our mouths you know it is the spicing of the words that we uh, really need through the speech that we have so this is a piece of advice that I have for you and the reason I say this is through my journey with the Quran alhamdulillah I have learned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, the dua or the supplications of the previous messengers as well as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well as some recommended duas uh, where Allah is instructing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say a specific supplication in a specific way it's all over the Quran Rabbana alayka tawakkalna wa ilayka anabna Rabbana this Rabbana that oh my Rabb this is what I'm asking you oh my Rabb grant me offspring oh my Rabb bless me in this way and bless me in that way so why don't we learn from that that all over our speech we just need to Say a few Rabbanas, inshallah, meaning uh, may the Almighty grant us this and grant us that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may the merciful, O oh, you who is most merciful, help us, have mercy on us, uh, open our doors, grant us guidance. So many different du'as that we make, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really open our doors. There you are. And at the same time, what we need to know is whenever we would like to read the Quran, let's be respectful, let's clean ourselves, let's make sure that we are dressed appropriately and let's uh, take it seriously. What is halal? People say these people chant their magical slogans on the meat. So when we eat it, we want to be Muslims. That is the most foolish statement I've ever heard. All the 
creatures have been given life by the Almighty. What gives me the right to take the life of a cow away? I don't have the right. So the Almighty says, well, under certain conditions, you may be granted permission to take that life away in a specific way. So I am not allowed to destroy the creatures of the Almighty for no purpose. I cannot even destroy the ecosystem without purpose. If I want to cut trees down, I need to ask myself, why am I doing it? If there's no purpose for it, leave the tree. It has life of a different nature. You're a Muslim. You need to be at peace with, the, with everything else. But yes, if there is a need for firewood or there is a need to clear the path, I may say in the name of the Almighty, the giver of the life, and I begin to cut that tree. So what about insects? Before you spray your mosquito repellent, that little sound that irritates you, before you spray your doom, you say in the name of the Almighty, Bismillah, you spray your doom. What happened? They were doomed. But that was for, for a purpose. You don't just go and destroy. If a reptile is harming you, 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 you may, by the name of the Almighty, you, you need to take his name because he's the giver of that life. Who are you to take it away? So when it comes to the animals, there are certain animals that are permissible to eat. You cannot just be barbaric. The way you have treated the animal from the point of its birth to the point of its slaughter is extremely important. You need to be completely humane, even with animals. You need to treat them, give them that life that they deserve, feed them properly, give them that air and the space. If you were to look at abattoirs that belong to non-Muslims, they are very barbarically run. To be honest with you, I've visited, I've seen, we are so shocked, nauseating. And people say, yeah, you guys are doing something that's very barbaric. Oh, come and see, we'll show you, show you how it's done, come. So now when we get to the, the cow, for example, or the sheep that has been fed properly, and it has not been force fed and kept in a pen like the ducks of the world and the chickens that don't even grow feathers anymore because they are modified. Their sole purpose of being given life is to grow until they are killed brutally in order to be served on the table. Not halal. We don't want that. It must be accorded its life. It must be treated as a proper chicken. It must be treated as an animal, a bird, whatever it is. It must be fed properly. And at the same time, you bring it to the pen. You slaughter it in a way that it does not witness the others. And at the same time, such a sharp blade. And why is it that the throat is used? Because of the central nervous system. Powerful statement. Sometimes people hack these animals to death. People say, you need to stun these animals. Did you know that there is research that proves that stunning an animal actually creates greater pain than if you don't stun the animal? People say, how? Go and check. You're confusing the animal totally. You're killing it unconscious. What are you talking about? Amazing. If you were to get cut with a blade as you're shaving, you won't even know that you're cut until water goes on it. Why? The razor was very sharp, very sharp. So we are to use a sharp blade, quick slice. When I burn my fingers, what happens? A message goes from the sensory nerves to my brain, central nervous system. It says, you are hurt, lift your hand up. It happens within a split second. But if the central nervous system is ruptured from the jugulars, the pain, the message goes up, it gets stuck there because it cannot go up anymore. Blood system, bloodstream out. So what happens? It numbs to a halt. That is halal. If you were to slice it, the message will not go from the bottom to the top, nor from the top to the bottom because the jugulars are gone. Wind pipe and food pipe. And you have to take the permission of the giver of that life when you are slaughtering it. If not, we don't want to eat that. You have stolen it from the property of God. Allahu Akbar. How can you just cut an animal? Who are you to take that life away? You need to say, in the name of the giver of the life here, I'm taking this by your permission. Such a humane way, beautiful. That is termed halal. You are taking the life away. And this is the original system of the Jews and the Christians. It is the original system that was taught by all the messengers. Islam adopts it quite strictly and so does Judaism. And I'd like to think Judaism adopts it even more strictly. Go and study, you will find it. Same system. So why do people pick on halal? It in fact is the most humane way. In fact, it is the way of being protected from horse meat. Allah protect us, yes. And the supervisors will ensure that things are happening. 
they will tell you we guarantee you that this thing was done properly and guess what it's not a horse my brother it is a privilege and honor to eat something that was slaughtered by the name of the giver of the life to say only for eating purposes consumption we took into consideration every rule that you have put and we have actually fulfilled everything so we hope we will now get the blessing of the food that we put into our mouth if not i'd rather eat the vegetables may allah protect us really what happens to the soul once a person dies and if someone is destined to suffer the pains in the grave does his body suffer or does his soul suffer jazakumullah khair that's another very important question also the same introduction that I, i i would like to say is that the answers for these questions have to be from revelation because we don't know so it has to be from revelation if someone has given you an answer and it's not from revelation it's a problem so getting back to what happens to the soul the soul leaves the body the hadith speaks of it getting to a place known as barzakh barzakh is a, is a place where the, these these arwah are kept these ruhs or these souls are kept Uh, waiting for the last day a person who's had goodness and so on the day is passing like a flash a person who's perhaps been a bad person it may pass a little bit slower but getting to the second part of the question the first part was where do the souls go they go into barzakh what exactly is the whole description of barzakh i have to stop where the quran and the sunnah have stopped we cannot describe beyond a certain point i will tell you look it's a waiting place it's the souls do not come back to greet the family members every year you need to know that some people say okay every year the soul comes back salam alaikum how are you some people say the soul comes back to us and cleans the home and some people say the soul comes back and does this and does that and i feel it those are you know jinn sometimes those are the devil sometimes those are the qareen sometimes that's something else those are spirits known as spirits in some traditions but it's not the soul we're talking about it's not the individual they don't come back to you and say hey how's it guys salam alaikum i remember one person says i can make your grandfather talk to you and then uh, the, the the brother says i i went to the man and i said okay let me talk to him and he says i heard my grandfather's voice i promise you it was my grandfather brother they are fooling you with the jinn they fooling you with the, with all these qareens don't be fooled the, the the souls are gone to a place known as barzakh that's it allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best when it comes to the connection of the soul and the body Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets the body feel the punishment together with the soul in a way that he knows fit that we don't know the explanation of that's what it is so when we say adabul qabr and the punishment of the qabr it is a reality and it is felt body and soul how i don't know allah knows i stop at that and i believe it because i cannot add or subtract i have to say ya allah one day well i don't even want to be be shown it because i don't want to be a part of it but one day if you want if you are curious perhaps if you get to the other side you can ask say ya allah how did you do that how was it for now it's called belief we believe in the unseen someone might say well these people their bodies were you know lost or their bodies were perhaps disintegrated because of something and how would they be punished well i still believe if allah wants he will do it and he will do it exactly that way how he does it he knows best that's how we stop in this way you protect yourself you protect your iman when we want to go into deep details that are not in the quran and the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding imaniyat and matters of belief we tend to burn our fingers when we burn our fingers by starting to add extra uh, you know cream on the on, on the cake and something which is not supposed to be that's when we falter may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us and may he make us from amongst those who do not become so inquisitive that we start asking you know questions that are uh, part and parcel of where we're supposed to have stopped in terms of belief may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us i just want to clarify that last point what this means is yes you are allowed to ask questions and you're allowed to ask any question you want under the sun but if the answer of the of the question is not found in revelation and that question is connected to belief then just stop there and say look allah knows best that's it and you will save yourself allah speaks about a murderer someone who murders a mu'min who is innocent allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that murderer will definitely have the anger and the curse of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will be cast into hellfire forever and ever wa man yaqtul mu'minan muta'ammidan fa jazauhu jahannam khalidan fiha wa ghadiba allah 'alayhi وَلَعَنَهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا 
whoever kills an innocent mu'min, whoever kills a fellow mu'min intentionally, whoever is a murderer, Allah says, for them not only is the anger, but the anger and the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are very, very few verses in the Quran which have made mention of both anger and curse of the Creator in one verse. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us protection. This is one of them. So therefore, even to point a weapon at a fellow believer is completely prohibited. At an innocent individual is completely prohibited. And remember, every non-Muslim around you is a potential Muslim. Every non-Muslim around you is a potential Muslim. My duty and your duty when it comes to the non-Muslims is to convey to them the beautiful message of Islam to want them to accept this religion as badly as we'd like it for ourselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us broad-minded and may He make us from amongst those who realize that the kuffar who are around us, it is our duty to portray to them the beautiful teachings of Islam. With the idea of letting them enter the fold of Islam, the hadith says, Wallahi, la an yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahida, khayrul laka min humurin na'am. If Allah has used you to guide even one person, it's better for you than the most expensive of the wealth of this whole dunya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. Who am I? Who am I? Can I tell you who I am? Zero. Nothing. I have no value. Not at all. Compared to others. Nothing. The value belongs to Allah. Imagine if you were so excited to see a man who has no value. I don't control heaven and hell. I don't control your goodness or sadness or happiness. I don't control What's going to happen to you in your grave? I don't control whether you're going to go to Jannah or not. Not at all. That is all solely and only in the control of Allah. Yet you were so excited to see me. Who am I? Nothing. Will you not be more excited to see Allah five times a day? Will you not be more excited to see Allah to communicate with your maker for Salatul Fajr? Just like you came here five hours earlier. Can you not go to the masjid five minutes earlier? It's a reality I have to say. I have to get it off my chest. Because I am nothing compared to what we need to do with Allah. There is no comparison. Who am I? If you truly want to sacrifice, even if you did not come here today, but you got up for Salatul Fajr, you are a champion. You are a winner. But if you came here and sat for five hours and did not read Salah, you have lost. You lost everything. May Allah forgive us. I apologize to you. I'm sorry. But this is the reality that needs to be uttered. قُلِ الْحَقَّ وَإِنْ كَانَ مُرَّا Say the truth even if it is bitter. You miss Salatul Maghrib that is coming shortly. Wallahi, you've lost everything. If someone were to ask you who is more important, Allah or this sheikh that came from Zimbabwe, that question itself is an insult because there is no comparison. You cannot bring those two in one sentence. Never. May Allah grant us steadfastness. So when I'm asking you to develop, I'm asking you to develop for the sake of Allah. I'm asking you to respect each other for the sake of Allah. I'm not inviting you towards me. No, not at all. I'm asking you for the sake of Allah. Help yourself by getting closer to the one who made you so that the day you die and go into your grave, you would have succeeded. You will be the happiest person. You will get the Jannah that we spoke about earlier. Jannah, arduha samawatu wal ard. The width of which is greater than the heavens and the earth. That is just your paradise. Greeting. People don't greet. Have you noticed that? We're in the masjid here right now. Do you know people will attend the function? They wouldn't have greeted each other. Even the person next to you, they wouldn't be greeting each other. There is an explanation of who should greet first. The one who's passing should greet those who are seated. Those in small numbers should greet those in a bigger number. And so on. The young should greet the old. But sometimes people don't greet. They just walk past. We look at them and say, they didn't greet. Look how arrogant. Stop saying that. What about you? You could have greeted. But I didn't need to greet because I was older than this guy. 
The hadith says the young supposed to greet the old. That whole discussion is irrelevant because the hadith says the best from you, the one who starts with the salam. You say assalamu alaikum. Whether they reply you or not is irrelevant. You did it for Allah. So your reward is written. When I say to you assalamu alaikum, you say wa alaikum assalam or you don't say wa alaikum assalam. My reward is written. It's now up to you to get a reward. So why must I be bothered whether you replied me or not? You may not have heard me. And this is why the best from amongst us are those who think good and who develop good excuses for others who might be doing something we haven't understood. It's called husnul dhan. You see someone do something, you see someone hasn't replied you, think to yourself, maybe they haven't heard me. Maybe they perhaps have a bit of wax in their ears. Okay, even that's a little bit derogatory. But anyway, maybe they haven't heard me. Maybe I didn't say it loud enough. Perhaps I didn't greet properly. Maybe they thought I was greeting someone else. All those maybes will take you to paradise. Why? Because they are good maybes. But the minute you see, no, he heard me loud and clear. He didn't want to greet. He arrogant. That uncle I've known him for the last so many years. He's always like that. Look at his face. All that will lead to more and more and more. The next time you see him, you would just look at him and you wouldn't even want to greet. It happens with the sisters as well. I'm talking about uncle, uncle. What about the aunties? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah grant us goodness. Sometimes it becomes tough. You know, we attend religious functions and we're like strangers to each other. We make people feel so unwanted. We make people feel like they're in the wrong place. Why? You're welcome. Mashallah, it's your place. We're all part of one huge family. Just like if calamity were to strike, we would reach out to everyone, whether they were Muslim, non-Muslim, tall, short, this race, that race, wherever. We would reach out to them. Just like that, in goodness, we should reach out to the same crowds. In the same way. Which means, no matter what race, no matter what ethnicity, no matter where they come from, what language they speak, how wealthy or poor they may be, no matter what religion they belong to, etc, etc. All that becomes irrelevant. Make sure you are the best as you are born. The first hardship that you may face is where you were born. Subhanallah. You might say how? And you might already know. You might have experienced it. What if you were born in a war zone? Was it your fault? No, it was Allah's test. That is evidence enough to prove that your maker decided to test you by making you be born in an area where it was going to be a war zone. Subhanallah, your test. Hardship. You were born into hardship as soon as you were born. In fact, when you were conceived, you started hearing sounds. You started hearing sounds of bombing, sounds of shooting. Sounds of people screaming and yelling. That is a test, wallahi. It is a powerful test. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those in that type of a test. Those who are being tested from when they are in the wombs of their mothers. But there is a test that actually goes beyond that one. You know what it is? Worse than being born in a war zone is when Allah has chosen for you that you will be born into this world with some challenge in the form of disability. So you're born and you did not see from day one. That is a hardship. And Allah says that hardship is not only for you, but we want to give the opportunity to those around you to earn their paradise through serving you. Wow. So, a person was born, they couldn't see. A child was born, cerebral palsy. A child was born perhaps without an organ. A child was born perhaps some form of deformity. The test is for the parents and for those around and the community and the philanthropists. The test is for them. Are you going to rise to the occasion? Are you going to help another of your kind? You've only got one more year to live. Let's see what you're going to do for this child that you witnessed and you saw. I remember a wealthy man. Again, I know him, but without names. Was watching a television channel. And in Niger, he saw people, he saw a specific child, a specific child eating the sand out of hunger. 
And this man was a multi-millionaire, perhaps into the billions. And he decided, I want to find out who this is. And I want to do something about these people. And wallahi, I'm not joking. He got hold of the channel. It was a Western channel, it was CNN. He got hold of whoever. He found out from his own people who are around him where that was. He got hold of people there. He found the exact location and he located the person. It took him a bit of time. He decided to build a school, to drill boreholes, to make roads, to do whatever he had to. I don't know about the roads, but I know he built a school and he gave them food and he taught them things and he did clothing for them and whatever else. He changed the whole community. And guess what? A few months later, he passed away of cancer. The same man. May Allah grant him Jannatul Firdaus. What prodded him to do this? He was flicking the channels. He was flicking the channels. He saw someone going through hardship. He felt it. He did not know them. He did not know who they were. He just knew they were human beings. They were suffering. This is a Muslim man. And he decided, I've got all the money in the world. What am I going to do? I've got all the money in the world. What am I going to do? Let me help these people. Later on, they found out that he did it for many, many communities. Subhanallah. That is how he spent his money. How have you spent your money? And we sit and we busy bad mouth the same people without even knowing the good they've done. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of the Almighty be on one and all. Today we will be discussing another very, very important topic, and that is what we see around us. What do we see? We see a lot of things. One of them is everybody is running, everybody is racing. Racing to do what? Racing to get more, to have more, to have the latest, to have everything the others have, and even more and better and to see who has the best and so on. This is more like a rat race, the race behind materialism. If we are to run behind materialism, materialism has no end. A lot of the times the example that people give is that of the mobile phone. We always want the latest, even if the phone we have does our job and it is good and it has been faithful to us. We still want to change it. We want to update it. Sometimes when we cannot even afford to have a mobile phone and we would have it, we would borrow, we would live on that which is credit in the sense that we owe people and we don't even have the means to own something and we want it. The same applies to a motor vehicle where you have a person who has a car, they've barely afforded it, but they want another one. They want to update it and they keep on updating it and they look at the other one and they want that one as well. And then they are never happy with what they have because they see what others have. We are taught as Muslims, be happy with what you have. Look at what you have, concentrate on it and thank the Almighty for, where, for what He has given you and for where He has placed you. And this is the contentment of the heart that is required by a believer. And we need to know, yes, if you can afford it very comfortably, then go to it. And maybe perhaps you, you are allowed to have it. But what you, de you do need to understand, and I do need to understand as well, is that I need to tailor make my life according to my budget. What I have is the budget. What I own is the amount that I have. I need to make sure that I buy that which I can afford. Why should I buy something I cannot afford? It is a burden on the shoulders. It is something that will bog me down. It is always a worry in the mind. Some people have, and we've seen this happening even in advanced countries, some people have lived on credit all their lives. So they have a job, the job pays them a good salary, their car is on higher purchase, the furniture is on higher purchase, the television on higher purchase, the computers on higher purchase, the phones on higher purchase, uh, the furniture, everything on higher purchase. So much so that even their holidays are not yet paid for. And they've just swiped a card and it keeps on adding. They did not calculate that one day we might lose the job. Then how are we going to pay for it? And this has happened. It has happened in the most of advanced, in the most advanced of countries. And we need to know that it can happen anywhere. And for this reason, Islam teaches us don't live on credit, 
Live your life according to your means. If you cannot afford a holiday, don't go on it. Or go on a more basic holiday. If you cannot afford a mobile phone, don't have one. If you cannot afford a vehicle, go with public transport. It might be better for you. And so on. Yes, we should aim right at the skies. No harm in that. But do not pretend like you're living on a cloud when you have not yet moved above the ground. Because that will probably bring you crashing to the ground. And this is why we say the race towards materialism does not stop. It continues. The more we run, the faster it runs. So we continue running behind it and there is no stopping. Sometimes it even gets to our marriages. And this is a point that might be a red button being pressed, but we need to say it. When a person is used to changing everything, every time a new model is out, they want a new car, a new phone, a new watch, a new this, a new house, a new... Some people who are weak, it might even seep into their marriages where they no longer are interested in their own wives. Why? There is a new model out, so to speak. What does that mean? There is someone who wears a different type of clothing, who has a different cut, different likes, and everything is totally different, much younger and so on. We need to be careful. We should never allow this to seep. When you forgive your spouse, you have helped yourself build a powerful relation. You learn to love one another. And when you have been forgiven by a spouse, do not abuse it. They are not ghafoor rahim They are not most forgiving, most merciful. They might be able to forgive you once, if you are lucky twice. In a lot of cases, it does not extend to a third time. They are human beings. But still, we are taught to forgive as many times as we can. But when we have been forgiven, don't look at it as a weakness. It's not a weakness. Many people think, you know what? Where is she going to go? No way. I'm giving her the life. I'm giving her everything. Wallahi, Allah will catch you. Allah will catch you. People think, I can do what I want. This woman here, I'm married to her. Where is she going to go? She's got five children with me. And I've lived with her for how many years? She can't do anything. She's got no one to go to. Her brothers and sisters are married. Her father and mother have passed away and so on. Now, it's okay what I do to her. Be careful. She might forgive you. You don't know that that forgiveness is not a weakness. It's actually a strength. The more she forgives you, the happier a life between her and Allah she will lead. And guess what? The fact that she has forgiven you does not necessarily mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. It doesn't mean Allah is happy. He's watching. He knows. The record is taken. He can see. So therefore, please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by trying your best not to repeat the sin. At the time of Rasulullah what were the Jews doing in Medina? Has anyone asked themselves that, this question? How did they come to Medina? They came to Medina because in the Torah and the Tilmud that the Jews believe in, there was description of the land in which the final messenger would come. And this final messenger was mentioned in the Torah. And the description was that this place would have date palms. And there were several other descriptions which fitted precisely to Medina to Munawwara. And that is why they all flocked to Medina to Munawwara. From amongst them were their leaders and the general public and so on. One day when Rasulullah made hijrah from Mecca to Medina, Abdullah ibn Salam, who happened to be one of the Jewish leaders, he was working in a farm of his around Medina. And he noticed the cloud moving. He noticed a group of people moving. And he noticed so many other signs. He was a rabbi. He noticed so many signs. He said, no, today is the day. We have all been waiting for so long. Today is the day that this prophet is going to come. So he left his work and he went towards this crowd of people who were blocking his view. He wanted to see the face of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he knew as soon as I see the face, I'm going to recognize whether he is a prophet or not. Because he'd seen all the other signs. The cloud was covering wherever he was and so on. So then he came and he had a peep at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And immediately he declared, this is the prophet of Allah. I bear witness that you are the prophet that we are waiting for. Subhanallah. So all the people around began to say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Do you know that this is the leader of the Jews? He is accepting Islam. He has come here and he is declaring that you are a messenger according to the description of the Torah. 
So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him and said, Ya Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Salam, come here. You are one of the leaders of the Jews. Why don't you go to the Jews and inform them that the messenger has arrived? So he said, Ya Rasulullah, I know my people. They will turn away. They will not listen even to me when it comes to their desires. I hope the Muslim Ummah is not doing this today. That when it comes to their desires, we are not interested in what is right and wrong anymore. We are interested in our own desires. Abdullah ibn Salam mentioned that this was a quality of his own people. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no, try with them at least. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made Abdullah ibn Salam go behind the wall. And the Jews were called of Medina. And he asked them, who is Abdullah ibn Salam? They said, he is our leader and the son of our leader. He is the most honest from amongst us and the son of the most honest. He is one of our champions and the son of the champion. He is a brother and the son of a brother. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what if I were to tell you that he accepted me as a prophet? They said, that is impossible. We don't even want to discuss that because it cannot happen. So Abdullah ibn Salam emerged from the back and said, Inni ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Immediately all the congregation who were there from amongst his people began to say, He is the liar and his father was a liar. He is a cheater and his father was a cheater. He is the worst and his father was the worst. And Abdullah ibn Salam looked at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, Do you know? Didn't I tell you, I know my people better than anyone else. So then what had happened? Banu Quraidah and Banu Nadir. These are the two clans of the Jews whom Abdullah ibn Salam had belonged to. They did not talk to Abdullah ibn Salam and the few who had accepted Islam with him. They didn't want to sit with them. They didn't want to associate with them. There was no intermarriage even between their children or even themselves. Absolutely no form of communication between them and their own people. So this used to touch them in their hearts. So they came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and complained. Abdullah ibn Salam himself said, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ever since we have accepted Islam, these people don't talk to us. They don't want to associate with us. They don't want to sit with us. They don't want to us to intermarry in any way whatsoever. And we don't have any friends now. Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam came down with verses. إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ عبد الله بن سلام and the group don't worry at all don't worry that you don't have friends your friend is Allah your friend is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your friends are all the believers, those who establish salah, and those who give zakah whilst they are in rukur. Subhanallah. He was so comforted with this, and he always used to say, Subhanallah, Allah has befriended me. Allah has befriended me. I complained I didn't have friends. What happens to us today? We decide to become a little bit religious. Sometimes a person becomes slightly religious. Some of his own or her own family members excommunicate them. Don't worry, Allah is your friend. Don't worry, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is your friend. Don't worry, the believers are your friends, inshallah. May Allah comfort us as well. If people have excommunicated you because you have now stood up for justice and the truth, don't worry, you are heading in the right direction, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us companionship of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those who love or those who understand the Quran, they love the recitation of the Quran because they know what it means. They are moved by it. Those who don't understand it and don't want to understand it, they become tired when the Imam takes 45 seconds more in the units of Salah. 45 seconds more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We are worried about seconds and minutes. I promise you the amount of people who look at their clocks when it comes to Salah, Taraweeh in Ramadan is unbelievable. I think we should be having a notice on every masjid door to say, like you remove your shoes, leave your watches outside. No time must be told inside this masjid. That's it. We would enjoy our prayer much more. Leave your watch at home. Don't look at the time. This is Allah. But a lot of us time, I remember reading Salah and I remember clearly there was a man next to me and every little while he looks at his clock and he's shaking his head. 
And I'm thinking, what's going on? You in salah, the imam is reading, you're looking at your clock and shaking your head. Instead of Abdullah, you've become Abdul clock. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. There are many Abdul clocks that appear in Ramadan. We're worshipping the clock every little while. Look at it, look at it. Yes, if there is something really wrong, like you know, for example, the Imam starts reading a long surah and he just doesn't end. Maybe you might want to raise the issue to say, you know, mashallah, you read very well, alhamdulillah. Or you want to raise it with someone to say, I think it was a little bit long because there are some old people, there are some children, there are some this and that, whatever, but in a nice way. But if for every small thing, you see there is a hadith that says the Imam must be considerate of the elderly. That does not mean he must read Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha and go down. No. Some people think because the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Imam must be considerate. So every rak'ah must be, Inna ta'ina kal kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar, Inna shani'a ka huwa labtar, Allahu Akbar, because I'm considerate of the old people I'm reading, Inna ta'ina. No. That is a wrong interpretation. Look at the Sunnah recitations, the Sunnah recitals of all the Salah. Fajr is meant to be slightly longer. Dhuhr is meant to be a long salah. Maghrib is a short salah. Isha is a slightly longer salah. Which means if you cannot cope because you are old, get a chair and sit. But do not let people cut down on the sunnah. I hope we've understood the meaning here. People misinterpret it. Some scholars also misinterpret it. They say, brother, you're reading too long. Brother, I'm reading the sunnah. This is the sunnah recitation. I'm supposed to be reading these surahs or this length in salah. And in Taraweeh, for example, well, let's talk about Salah and Farad first. So if you want me to, if I'm going beyond the Sunnah, you can encourage me to cut to the Sunnah. But if you want me to read Inna A'tayna, every single Salah, then trust me, that is not what is meant by the Hadith, which says, take into consideration the elderly and the women and the children and so on, and the sickly. May Allah forgive us. Can a man correct his Muslim woman colleagues on their appearance and their on for following pro proper ruling of Islam? For example, a man corrects a woman that her lipstick is too much. MashaAllah. My sister, what was he doing looking at that lipstick? MashaAllah. Uh, the reality is, if politely he reminds a Muslim sister, I don't think to say your lipstick is too much is actually respectful. To be honest with you, if I saw a sister you know, full makeup and whatever. The first thing I would do, inshallah, I hope Allah strengthens me to just look down, you know. And uh, I'm being as realistic as possible, my brothers. You know, I'm trying to word it respectfully. Don't think that I'm a person who's not a human being. I'm just like you. So inshallah, I try my best to look down and I wouldn't embarrass that sister in that, in that condition. Not at all. It's the wrong time and place. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> you know, wallahi, what are you doing? You know, the woman will start hating religious people. What are these guys all about? No way. You get an opportunity. You find the right moment. You show them that you care for them as a Muslim sister. And she's not just an object. And slowly but surely, Wallahi, sometimes without speaking, it will start improving itself because they will realize that, hey, you know what? Hang on. I am not created by Allah to attract the opposite sex. And to be honest, I've spoken to non-Muslim women sometimes when the opportunity has arisen. And a lot of them feel, no, it's, it's, I feel good when all the men look at me. I get angry when a man don't look at me, man. You know, it happened to me once we were in an airport in one of the European countries and I walked away, I walked past and there was this woman who was literally dressed to kill, you know, and subhanallah, by the help of Allah, and I'm, I'm relating it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are human being. I didn't even look, it didn't even tickle me. And she actually came up to me a little while later and say, why didn't you look? And I'm like, astaghfirullah, now you want me to look basically, you know. <laughs> And I said, no, sister, I respect you so much that I'd, I'd appreciate, you know, and so on. And this has happened to me not a long time ago. And it's happened to other scholars in the past. And I've mentioned this in some of my, my, my lectures as well. So I think to correct a sister, there is a way, you know, a respectful way, a dignified way. But it is a duty to do something about it. You know, when you see something bad, you have to correct it. So when you correct it, you correct it on different levels. But you are never harsh. 
The Prophet ﷺ was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It is because of the mercy of Allah that you are lenient towards them. Had you been harsh and hard-hearted towards them, they would have dispersed. Wallahi, the same rule applies. You see a Muslim and every one of us, myself included, we need correction. Imagine if someone comes to you and just starts telling you things and you know you're an idiot and you're useless and what you said and what you did and how you operate. You won't appreciate it because that's the nature of man. But if you want to correct someone, brother, mashallah, Tabarakallah, you know, so on. And if it's a sister, you don't need to get into all that detail, but at least you need to show concern. Uh, sometimes when Muslims have Muslim colleagues who are of the opposite sex, they prefer to talk to non-Muslims than their own Muslims, you know, and this is something that beats me. I don't understand what's the logic behind it. I'm not saying you shouldn't be communicating with any of your colleagues, Muslim or non-Muslim, but I'm saying the poor sister is firstly a Muslim. Perhaps she looks up to you. I know of Muslim sisters who've been motivated at workplace just because their male colleagues never miss a salah. And the sister says, I had a male colleague who never ever missed his salah. And I was so embarrassed because I just used to sit through the lunch and do nothing. And then I started, I said to myself, if he does it, let me do it. And there was no communication. It was just looking. So this is why we say, subhanallah, there is a way of doing things. So uh, it is a duty of anyone, either one, to correct the other. But with respect and with, with wisdom. You know, we heard the verse beautifully recited earlier on. Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. When you are calling towards the path of Allah, call with wisdom. Don't call with, uh, uh, you know, th the first thing that comes to your head. Sit, think about it, make dua to Allah about it, ask Allah's guidance about it. Then do something. You might want to send a beautiful email. And you know, when you send an email, there's a way of doing things. Because if you just send an email to the same sister who's working with you and say, Sister, uh, like the sister just said, you, 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 wear, you wear too much lipstick at, at work and that is haram as it is lipstick is red and the color of Jahannam is also red. <laughs> come on, come on. There's a way of talking. So you say, sister, mashallah, may Allah strengthen you, may Allah help you, may Allah bless you and your loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you goodness and greatness. I've got so many weaknesses of my own. Please highlight them if you see them. Please do not feel bad that I'm highlighting to you something minor that I believe, you know, it was, if it wasn't my duty as a Muslim, I wouldn't even have bothered. But I felt very, very slightly that I should perhaps let you know. And as I say, before I let you know, if there's anything that you see in me that needs attention, please let me know. And the, the point that I wanted to raise was, you know, perhaps if you'd like to consider uh, or, or reconsider the way you wear your makeup. Allahu Akbar, I'm trying to wear it carefully. This is just an example based on what the sister's saying. Or it is much more palatable. A person will take it, they'd say, Jazakumullah khair, I appreciate, make dua for me, I thank you, because of how you said it. This goes back to the way you talk. May Allah grant us goodness and wisdom, but it is our duty to correct one another. Wallahu alam. You know, I want to give you one simple example. I was traveling in one of the Middle Eastern countries a long time back. And I happened to cross the border. And when I was coming back, I wanted to cross back into the country that I was, that I had left from. And it was the time of Jumu'ah. And they told me, you have a Zimbabwean passport, you actually need a visa to go in. And I told him, but hang on, I was here about 10 days back when I was crossing and no one told me this. I crossed and there was no visa. He said, no, the law has just changed two days ago. Now I have a flight to catch and I'm making dua to Allah. And I say, Ya Allah, help me. Ya Allah, I'm in need. Here, my, my entire family, they're not affected because obviously they have a different nationality. But with me, subhanallah, ya Help me, Allah, what am I going to do? I've got a flight to catch and I need to return home. And so it was the time of Jumu'ah and the Adhan went. And mashallah, there was a masjid in the border post. And so I went and making dua to Allah and I sat down. And the Imam spoke about, now this is called the help of Allah. Not from me, nothing at all. The Imam was speaking about helping people in desperation. Helping people in need and how Allah will assist you if you assist someone who's desperate, who's in need. And guess what? There was a man next to me who greeted me. And I greeted him back. And subhanallah, I greeted him, I acknowledged him and so on. And at the same time, in fact, I greeted him just before the, the talk had started. And then I greeted him immediately after the talk. And I, I nodded my head, smiled at him and so on. And we started our salah. We were standing in the saf, straightening, you know, the, the feet and the, 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 the toes and whatever else. And I started my salah and I ended. And when I finished, I made a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, I don't know. It's only you that's going to help. And so what happened is, 
I came out, I had hope in my heart, but I was also making a plan B, you know, to say, let's go back and we'll do this, we'll change tickets, perhaps leave from the, another city altogether. And as I went in, I told this brother who was behind the counter that, look, you know what, please, I need your help. He says, only my boss can do it for you. So can I see him? He says, yeah, well, you can, maybe. You can enter that door and if he's there, you're lucky. So I went by the door, there was someone cleaning. Knocked on the door, the door opened. Who was the boss? The man who sat next to me just the time of the khutbah and salah. And he read right next to me. And guess how I started my story? Assalamu alaikum. You know, you can, you can remember the smile, can't you, you know? So I looked at him and I'm, I'm saying to myself, let me try and choose the best way of convincing him such that he will not be able to say no if he has a heart. I said, you know, mashallah, I'm in need. I'm desperately in need. And I'm convinced Allah will send the help. And I hope and I pray that help can come through you at least so that inshallah, you know, I will be able to at least cross here. He looks at me and he thought for a moment and I'm quite certain that the words of the Imam were ringing in his head. And then he tells me something. He says, you know, you're right. It's only from Allah, not from me. He wrote on my, in my passport, this man has been given oral permission to enter the country. You know, the Arab nation, some of them, they have this. I don't know about now, but I'm talking of quite a while back. So, he, and he wrote it. I went to the front. The man looked at it and smiled. He stamped it and let me cross. As simple as ABC. But my life was coming to an end, basically, if that didn't happen. If not to an end, but what I mean is, you know, it was going to be quite difficult. And then I told myself, I said, you know, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine if we didn't greet. Imagine if I just sat, imagine if he didn't greet. It was his quality, he was a big boss. I didn't even know. But he greeted and this is what helped. And I greeted back. And this is why, remember, sometimes we are arrogant. We don't want to, it's shaitan that overtakes us. We are human. We need to check it again. Make sure you remove it, fight it, fight it. Be humble. You know, I've seen people with mega wealth and you'll never pick up that this man has wealth. And I've seen people with next to nothing and they, they have their first thousand dollars and next thing they feel like, SubhanAllah, I'm Bill Gates, Allahu Akbar, Bill Gates. I always used to wonder why Bill Gates is so wealthy. But then I realized that the dollar in America is called the bill. Have you thought of that? It's called the bill. So he's the one who has the key to the door, Allahu Akbar. That's perhaps him. But for us, Allah has the key. Allah has the key to the door. We don't need the green bills, mashallah. We need entry into Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness of the dunya as well as goodness of the so special that when a male marries a female, he is reminded constantly that who you have married is the special child of someone, dear to someone. So we tell the husbands that when you look at your wife, don't just look at her as your wife. That's not the only title she has. She had a title before that which was more dear and more valuable. What was it? She is the daughter of so-and-so. She also has her own family that loves her and respects her. So do not disrespect her. Do not abuse her. Like they say, don't make her cry. You know, when my wife cries, I always tell her I'm supposed to, I'm not supposed to allow you to cry. She says, I cry out of joy. Mashallah. Okay, that's good. That's a good sign. So if you're crying out of joy and happiness, Alhamdulillah. But if you're crying out of, you know, sadness, you're stuck. There's no way forward. Wallahi, Allah has heard the cry of a wife and a daughter. If you take a look at Surah Al-Mujadala, named after a woman who came through in order to present her case to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the husband became disinterested in her. Listen to this and I inshallah I will end on this note. I tell you very interestingly, there was a woman known as Khawla binti Thalaba radiallahu anha. So what happened to her is she was married and mashallah, you know, a pretty beautiful woman. Next thing expecting she has a child and when you have a child, what happens? Subhanallah, people forget that you've now born children. You've, you've graduated into a new level of, you know, motherhood now and so on. You will not be the same girl you used to be 20 years back. Things have to change. Perhaps you may change in so many ways. You become wiser and perhaps you may even become a little bit heavier. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. She complained because her husband started losing interest or showed disinterest. She, he was not interested. And he started saying whenever she was trying to get him, get his attention, he would say, you're just like my mother, man. It's okay. You know, you're just like a mother. You're just like my sister and so on. She went to Muhammad وسلم, crying, weeping, complaining. What do I do? This man is saying this to me. He, he refuses to touch me. And at the same time, he is the one who impregnated me. He gave me the children. He is the one who did this, this, this. When I married him, I was in tip top shape and so on. My mothers and sisters, I just want to pause for a moment to tell you that that does not mean that when you have given birth, you should just lose yourself. No, go back. You will be able to retain a lot. If you work on it, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Whether they are sit-ups, leg-ups, whatever you want to call them, they work. <laughs> Trust me, they actually work, dedicatedly. So don't use a hadith in order for you to throw yourself, you know, to the side. No, work on it. You will feel good by the will of Allah. Like I said, do it for the right reasons. Going back to this narration. So as she's complaining, do you know what happened? The Prophet ﷺ, obviously it's a difficult situation. What do you say? You need to convince the man. Verses were revealed. قَدْ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ قَوْلَ الَّتِي تُجَادِلُكَ فِي زَوْجِهَا وَتَشْتَكِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Indeed. Allah has heard the argument of the woman who has come to you complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has heard it. And then he gives the response and it's a long uh, set of verses where Allah speaks of the punishment of those who say those type of statements and how special and important the woman is. You don't just say these words. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to make the correct decisions in life. And this is why we say there will be verses in the Quran that sometimes people may not understand. There are verses of ahkam. There are verses of rules and regulations. You know, a, a young boy came to me and I was so touched because it proved that he reads the Quran. He says, I read in the Quran that it's okay to drink, to drink alcohol. And I'm, I know it's haram because I'm a Muslim. So can you explain to me what's going on? Look at the wording, beautiful wording. Look, a young boy words it so respectfully because he says, I know it's haram. I know I'm not allowed and I know alcohol is abomination. But how come there's a verse of the Quran which says, Ya amanu la salata wa antum sukara hatta ta'lamu, hatta ta'lamu ma ta'kunun. Oh, you who believe, do not come close to salah. And if you are in a, in an intoxicated state until you are sane and you know what you're saying, subhanallah. So I said that actually is not allowing or permitting drinking. It was only dealing with a certain stage. Alcohol has been prohibited in four stages. And then I explained to him how that initially the, you know, the, the people were involved in alcohol and intoxicants in a very big way. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a hatred in the hearts of the believers for this item. And when the hatred was in, he cut, he cut it completely and he says, فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ The next, the verse came later on in Medina Munawwara where it was totally prohibited. And what did the Sahaba radiallahu anhum do? The few of them who were still involved, they had immediately spat it out. They dropped it out and it is reported that the gullies and alleys of Medina were flowing because everybody got rid of whatever they had immediately so he understood it he says oh mashallah at least now i know what's going on and that's a gift of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but there comes other people who say i disagree with this and disagree with that why do you call yourself a muslim if you want to disagree muslim is the one who has surrendered it's the word of allah and trust me those who have read the other books the testaments and everything else that is in existence in terms of spiritual directories you will find that the quran is on a league of its own completely of its own. There is nothing that can compete with the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who dedicate 
our lives to the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu My brothers and sisters, promise yourselves and promise Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, not a day will pass without us having something to do with the Quran. Read it, understand it, read its meaning, even if it means one single verse. Talk about it, speak to others, go to work and say, today I read this verse. This is what it is. You are adopting the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Balighu anni walau ayah. Convey from me, even if it means a single verse, a small amount, but convey it. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala use me to do that and use every one of you to do that. Jazakumullahu khair.